Welcome to the National Pulse. I'm Raheem Kassam, editor-in-chief of the NationalPulse.com. Can we have a chat for a minute, please? Can we have a chat about what happened in Denver, please? Can we talk about how a man was murdered for his political preferences and it has scarcely attracted a peep from the national media? Even Republican politicians have been relatively quiet about it. Let me guess. Marco Rubio found something about QAnon on his Facebook and decided his life, therefore, didn't matter. I'm being facetious, of course. I have no idea what Mark, uh, Senator Rubio's deal is, nor do I care. But I can for certain tell you this. If Lee Keltner was left-wing or gay or an ethnic minority, this would not just have been front page news for days, but there'd be riots, there'd be looting, Al Sharpton would be getting on a private jet, there would be panel discussions, teaching moments, and the lambasting of those who tried to speak out about the matter while not having experienced the type of discrimination that Lee Keltner had experienced. But only if, only if he was on the left or gay, or an ethnic minority. But because Lee Keltner was a white man who supported President Trump, his life, we're reminded, doesn't matter, didn't matter. Here's Lee Keltner with a friend of his. Here's Lee Keltner caring for a child. Just want to make sure we get the images up here. And here's Lee Keltner as the world last saw him. Dead on the ground with a bullet in his head. The result of an Antifa friendly activist in an Antifa friendly news network who wanted him dead. And they want you dead too. I remember saying those words to a 20,000 strong crowd in London a few years ago. I said, they want you dead. And I remember hearing some guffaws. Some people thought I was being hyperbolic. I'm not. They want you dead. They even put up yard signs saying as much. This image we're about to put up was sent to me from a friend in Colorado today the same state in which Lee Keltner was murdered on Saturday. The yard sign says Biden or die. It says Biden or die. They're sold online via Instagram and a website called midnightgrim.com. That website's hosted by somebody in Oregon who calls herself Kate Kenobi, K-A-I-T, Kenobi. Yeah, like Star Wars, it says on her website. Kate Kenobi's real name appears to be Kate McNally, and she went to the University of Boulder in Colorado. And Kate McNally wants you dead. And she wants to make money off her murderous hatred for you in the process. This Biden or die yard signs cost a whopping $32 for a sign made of paper. Oh, sorry. They're made of four millimeter corrugated plastic, plastic with semi-gloss surface. Great for outside. Includes metal step stakes for placement in the yard. That's how they're advertised on Kate's website, midnightgrim.com. She writes under the sign on her website, we cannot let Dumpy win. All proceeds go to making more stuff like this for my own neighborhood. Presumably she means more stuff with incitement to murder on it. And Kate McNally's website is sicker than just that sign. You can click on a link on her homepage. It says, learn about the darkness. And it takes you to her personal blog, which states, quote, you may find yourself curious about the name Midnight Grim. Here's a glimpse into my life in regard to my new brand identity. 
She goes on. She says, "You'll find the grim symbol in European folklore, a death omen. It is often described as a large supernatural black dog. It appears at night, often in cahoots with the devil, bringing dark messages of doom or perhaps leading a character directly to the gates of hell." It goes on. Quote, "Sometimes the grim lives inside you." He's the cornerstone of fear and darkness. End quote. Well, Kate's address, as she lists on her website, don't worry, I'm not about to dox her. She lists as six 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 Necropolis Lane, Fire Island, Hell, four twenty sixty nine. Nice touch. Her phone number she lists as six 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 six. Before adding. Just kidding. I am an introvert, and if you dropped in on my office, my head would probably fall off. Oh, poor Kate, poor introverted Kate, making yard signs that encourage the murder of those who defy her politics. Poor Kate and her website MidnightGrim.com, who are charging people nearly forty dollars for people to place signs on their front lawns which demand death for those who oppose their satanic cult. Well, Kate's head might fall off. As a result of being made famous by the National Pulse, but Kate's activities may well have led to a man getting his head blown off. I'm serious, and it could lead to more. Another debate between Colorado Senate candidates Hickenlooper and Gardner takes place tonight, and I hope Senator Gardner makes mention of the fact that Trump supporters in his state are now being murdered by Antifa activists. So far, I haven't seen a tweet from Senator Gardner. I hope we hear something soon. And my guest in the first segment of this show is Steve Cortez, a senior advisor to the Trump campaign. We'll be talking to him about the latest economic numbers, and later on, we'll be talking to Natalie Winters about who's moderating the Colorado debate and why we should care. In the meantime, this is the National Pulse, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the National Pulse. My guest in this segment and the next is Steve Cortez, Trump campaign senior advisor. Steve, we're really grateful for you、uh, joining us today.、Um, I had a heart attack this morning when I woke up and looked at what the markets were doing. So I hope you can explain to us some of the、uh, some of the fundamentals behind、uh, what's going on here, Steve.、Uh, just before I get to that, Biden or die are the yard signs, Steve. What do you make of that? You know that's the worst kind of, of fear politics, right? And unfortunately, we've seen a lot of this from the Democrats、uh, playing pandemic politics, trying to spread fear and an irrational level of fear. By the way,、uh, I think the president has this just pitch perfect. We should take the virus seriously. We should take reasonable precautions. People who are highly vulnerable to the dire effects of the virus, they need to be particularly protected and guarded. But for the rest of society, we should not live in fear of it. We should not live in fear of each other,、uh, and we cannot let it dominate our lives. On Unfortunately, what the left sees here is a political power play and a chance to to gin up fear, just the same way they they gin up racial division, for example,、uh, for purely partisan political aims. So it's reprehensible, but sadly, I'm not surprised with three weeks to go. And I also think, quite frankly, the Democrats know、uh, what the what the mainstream media won't admit, which is that they are in trouble.、Uh, that these battleground states are all in play. And I'm not saying that we've won them, by the way. I'm not saying we're cruising in these states. But what I'm saying is they're all in play. It's going to be a cage match for the next three weeks. Yeah, Steve, you look at the difference. I saw a meme earlier today, and it was it was President Trump removing his mask and Biden putting his mask on side by side, and one said one side said hope, and the other side said fear. To you, is this increasingly? I know we've got to get to the economics, but I am interested in this. To you, this seems to me like it's increasingly becoming about fear—fear fear of the polling stations, fear of the virus, fear of Trump, fear of Russia, all of this. And you just look at the difference between when the president goes out there and has a rally, which was always broadcast here on Real America's Voice in full, and the difference between when Biden does it. Biden's rallies are f- f- scaredy cat rallies, right? There's eight people there. They're sitting in these. Circles. Sometimes they're in their cars. Meanwhile, there's 200 Trump supporters right outside his rallies, heckling him as he's trying to give a speech. 
when you get more demonstrators to show up to your events than actual supporters to show up to the events, uh, that's a problem, clearly. You know, let me uh, give you just a small personal story related to this idea of, of the hope and optimism versus the fear. When I was at the presidential debate in Cleveland beforehand, the two respective staffs came into the hall at roughly the same time, uh, Team Trump that I was part of, and then Team Biden. And it was very interesting to see, even with their masks on, you could tell, they were all scowling. They were all dour. Uh, and, and some people on our team knew people on their team, you know, both in the business of politics, said hello, so-and-so. They didn't say hello back. They acted as though we weren't there. And we walked in uh, as a group of people who were, uh, you know, chest proud, uh, optimistic, you know, ready to rumble in politics. It was, it was really fascinating. I wish, I wish it had been filled. I wish people could see what I'm relaying to you. But that was indicative of the larger truth here, which is uh, Donald Trump is speaking primarily about a renaissance in America, about a return to our constitutional principles, about the kind of future that we can create. And Joe Biden, unfortunately, is trying to prey on fear, you know, as I mentioned, irrational fear of the virus, and also racial strife. And how does he do that? He does it by lying. He continually spreads the Charlottesville lie, which I believe is the most malicious lie in American public life. The, the idea that our president called reprehensible, violent bigots in Charlottesville very fine people. Of course, the exact opposite is true. He explicitly condemned them. But nonetheless, Joe Biden not only spreads this lie, but is often aided and abetted in spreading this lie by a complicit corporate media, including, by the way, even Fox News, because Chris Wallace, the host of that first debate, who I believe acted more as Trump's opponent rather than a fair moderator than, than even attempting to be an yeah. actual neutral yeah. referee, he helped him spread that malicious lie. So these are the, the tactics of the left, fear and division, because then they gain control. Now, listen, I'll be the first to admit I, I'm in the business of persuasion and the different the, the business of messaging. Fear is powerful. OK, and it does convince people to take actions. Uh, but uh, the, the hope and optimism that we offer is also very powerful. And we have to just work our tails off for these next three weeks to convince the American people that we have both the record looking backward as well as the agenda looking forward uh, for a much better, safer and more prosperous America. I didn't mean to get off topic to get and, and draw you off topic, Steve, as well. But that the Biden or die sign just really, really uh, upset me on the basis of what happened in Denver uh, last Saturday. And we're going to get into more of it later on in the show. So I don't need I don't need you to, to, to talk any more about it. I just I just uh, Biden or die. And then you've got people being murdered um, because they don't want to vote for Biden. Interesting juxtaposition there. So, Steve, look, tell us about the, the underlying things that we should be looking for here, because as you say, a lot of this is going to be about hope. A lot of it is going to be about what the future portends for the average American. So talk to us about the economy and, and what we should be looking for right here. And to try to allay your fears, first of all, regarding the stock market, and I spent 25 years uh, as a trader on Wall Street before Donald Trump dragged me into this crazy business of politics, so I still pay really close attention to the markets and all the data. Uh, look, markets have been fairly volatile lately, meaning that there are fairly wide swings, but also remember in context, these wide swings are extremely close to all-time highs. Uh, so for most people who don't pay day-to-day -day attention to the market, for example, on the S&P 500, which is probably the best, broadest gauge of where the market is, we're only 2% away from all-time highs today. Um, so even with volatile sessions, many of which are politically related, uh, basically when, when Wall Street's convinced that we're going to get a, de a stimulus deal out of Capitol Hill, it rallies. When they're not convinced, it goes down. I mean, we, but my point is, uh, let's put it in context, only 2% from the all-time highs for the S&P 500. But more importantly, I think to me and to most Americans than the stock market, we want the stock market to do well, but is how well is Main Street doing? How are small businesses doing? How are wages doing? And right now, all of the metrics on all of those scores I just mentioned are just absolutely exploding. And it's something you won't hear about from corporate media because it's not part of their narrative. And let me get specific here. Just yesterday, we got out the Small Business Optimism Index. It's put out by the National Federation of Independent Business. NFIB is the biggest organization representing small businesses all across America. Uh, they survey their members regularly and they, and they present a lot of data to the public. Their Business Optimism Index, uh, which understandably had cratered into the spring with the shutdowns. It has now regained all of the pandemic losses and then some. We are back to where wow. small business wow. optimism was in January. Uh, the way they read it, we're back at 104 points. The point part doesn't really probably matter to most of your viewers. The point is we're back to where we were in January, the pre-China virus days. And we've done it in just a matter of months. So it's very Steve, real. It's Steve. palpable. 
But Steve, but Steve, we've got to go to a break here, a break. so just hang on. But Stephen, I want to get your thoughts on this afterwards. I'm being told by the front pages of the Washington Post and the New York Times every day that we're in dire straits. We'll get your thoughts on that after this break. Something I think a lot of television people don't do live is look at the live conversation that's taking place uh, on their YouTube live stream, for instance, of the show. So I'm watching on Real America's Voice on the live chat right now, and I see the message pop up from Leslie that says, I like that Steve Cortez renaissance. Steve, tell us about the renaissance. Is a renaissance, Leslie. I like you too. Uh, there's a, there's an economic renaissance going on in this country, and again, you're not going to hear about it much from corporate media because uh, it doesn't fit the narrative. I mentioned previously small business, which is just surging back in confidence. That's just one of many metrics that show us how well this country is doing. Uh, we just got the September jobs report. It was another blockbuster report over the last five months. Over 11 million jobs have been added back to the economy, and not just any jobs, Raheem, but quality ones with 4.7 percent annualized wage growth, which is stellar. Speaking of wage growth, if we can look backward for a moment, the, for the entire year 2019, the last full pre-pandemic year, we had the highest wage growth in American history by a mile, 6.8% wage growth for the year. And by the way, the deplorables did even better than that. Blue collar wage growth was a stunning 9% for the year. Minorities, blacks and Hispanics did better than the overall 6.8% rate. So both past and present, this president creates the conditions for prosperity and it's happening again right now. And by the way, that's not just my view. It's the view of a majority of Americans. Gallup asks, are you better off now than you were four years ago? They've been polling this question since the 1980s when Ronald Reagan used that slogan to win the presidency in 1980. Well, the highest uh, report ever of, uh, of affirmative of people saying, yes, I am better off uh, than I was four years ago. 56% right now, the majority of Americans, strong majority but, say but, but that they Steve, are better off. Steve, Joe, Joe, Joe Biden says that if you're one of those 56% of people, then you must have a very bad memory. Pretty rich coming from him. Uh, he's not somebody, you know, talk about glass houses. <laughs> he's not someone who should be castigating anyone on their memory. Uh, but yeah, so first he insulted these people, said, well, they just don't remember as if they're unaware of their personal financial situation. Uh, but then secondly, he said, and this, by the way, is a rare moment of agreement between Joe Biden and me and our campaign. He said, well, if you believe that, you shouldn't vote for me. So let's take Joe Biden at his word. 56% of the American people at least should not vote for Joe Biden. Also, I think it's important for him to put that number in context, just to, to in let Joe you know Biden's how, own how words, Biden, by the way. way, correct in his own words, yeah. uh, just how important, how, how really fabulous that 56 percent number is. No president facing reelection again, going all the way back to the 80s, has ever been north of 50. The highest that number ever got for reelection was in 1996 uh, when the economy was roaring. Bill Clinton got a, a read of 50. Every other president had numbers in the 40s or in the case of George H.W. Bush, his number was only 38, which is largely why he lost reelection. So this president uh, is breaking the mold, as he often does. And I believe ultimately the American people, this is a very unusual year, 2020. But one thing I think that will be typical compared to historical norm, people make their voting calculus based primarily off of the decision of which candidate will make me more prosperous and the country more prosperous. And on that score, uh, this president has a compelling case, and it's why I believe I'm not taking anything for granted. Uh, I'm not remotely being complacent, but, it, but I do believe and I'm confident that we're going to win primarily for that factor. Steve, let me ask you a question, because uh, as I always tell you, whether it's on this show, whether it's in person, um, I always tell you, look, econ economics was not my best subject in school. My old teacher, my old business studies teacher, Mr. Corshaw, will tell you um, Raheem had a, had, a, had a few problems dealing with, you know, curves and graphs and data and all of that stuff. Right? I wanted to play football, by which I mean soccer. So let me ask you this. A lot of people will totally be on side with a lot of what you're saying, but they will also be skeptical that, hey, we're going into the last whatever it is, 19 days before an election. So am I just hearing Steve Cortez, Trump campaign senior advisor, using talking points? So I want to ask you a little bit of a deeper question about the fundamentals of the economy, the underlying, because a lot of people are worried that after what we've seen in 2020, that we've got maybe another 
subprime crisis looming on the horizon or something like that. Is there anything you can tell us about the fundamentals of the economy that will make people feel better about going into next year? No, absolutely. And by the way, to draw a comparison to past uh, manias and then bubbles in this country, uh, housing, let's look at new home sales. So new home sales for the month of August, most recent month we have, was the best number since 2006, uh, since the housing boom of 06. So a 14 year record on, on new home sales. That's a fantastic number for the whole country, by the way, because not only is it indicative of confidence among the people who are purchasing those homes, but it also means a whole lot of, of economic activity to construct those homes and then to fill them up with stuff, with appliances and furniture and electronics. But my point here is that number is far better than the 2006 number because it's not built on quicksand. Back in 2006, it was built on a lot of liar loans. Uh, it was built on uh, the cocktail waitress in Las Vegas putting nothing down and buying a three hundred thousand dollar condo with the intention of flipping it uh, in a couple. You know the, the stuff of the movie The Big Short. If the audience out there has seen that movie, I think it's a really entertaining movie. It's also quite accurate about what went on then. Th that is not the case today. Anybody out there who's gotten a mortgage lately can attest getting a mortgage is difficult right now. The credit standards are stringent. The documentation is intense. It's not easy to get a mortgage, but nonetheless, because rates are low and because confidence is rising, the housing sector is taking off in this country. I uh, know it's not built on chicanery or, or nonsense uh, or liar loans. This time it's very real. One other thing I'd like to point out too is how well America's doing relative to the world. If we look, for instance, at, at services uh, PMI, that's the Purchasing Manager Index, that survey is done all over the world. Uh, and it, it's a real world survey of, of actual purchasing managers at companies and asking them, are you buying? What are you buying? How much? And again, it's done globally. Now the US has gotten back all the pandemic losses. Uh, our PMI is now at 55, anything above 50 signals expansion, below 50 contraction. If you look at the European zone as a whole, they are at 48. They are still in contraction zone. So not only is the United States doing really well outright, but it's even more impressive if you view it in the context and comparison to our peers, to our industrial peers, uh, for example, in Europe. So it, it is an American success story. It's about economic exceptionalism. The benefits are flowing to blue collar people. It's flowing to everybody, but particularly to blue collar people. We have a terrific terrific economic story to tell. It can be hard to get that story across and to get that message across because corporate media is just a cacophony of fear. Uh, yeah. It really is, and, and paranoia. But it's my job to get, that, to get that news across, and thankfully, your show is one of the platforms to do so. And we're always really grateful for having you. Steve, we've got about 30 seconds before we have to break. Just tell us, how is the president? He's doing great. He's absolutely full of energy. Listen, he was like a racehorse, a thoroughbred who was kept in the starting gate. He couldn't wait to get out, uh, and he is galloping. And he's got a gallop to victory. We've got another rally planned for tonight. I thought last night's was fantastic in Florida. Today, he's going to the industrial heartland, Johnstown, PA. Uh, he is going to hustle and grind and win. Amazing. Amazing. Steve, thank you so much. Steve Cortez from the Trump campaign, thank you so much for having me. You heard it here first. President Trump's a horse. We'll be right back. Well, I don't know about all of you at home watching the Amy Coney Barrett proceedings. Now, firstly, I've got to tell you, I, I'm very honest with the audience. I'm explicitly honest about this stuff. I find it so boring to watch those things. Um, but it's important. But I just, my eyes, you can probably even see it, my eyes just glaze over as, oh, the questions that are being asked are so bad. But... I gotta say, from what I have seen, she is comporting herself just amazingly up there um, in that. So I just wanted to, to make a comment on that uh, because I'm sure at some point in the day uh, after this show, I insisted I don't want any of the I don't want any of the proceedings on during this show today. There's a lot of news. There is news galore out there right now. Whenever I think of news, by the way, oh, I gotta check the news. I gotta check the news. I always go to my good friend Kane's website, citizenfreepress.com, go to the Bongino Report, um, go to Watfinger and all these other sites that are, that are serving as far better aggregators than like the Drudge Report or anything like that. And uh, I'm looking at citizenfreepress.com and there is just news on news on news at the moment. And who better <laughs> to talk to us about the news than Raheem Kassam <laughs> and Natalie Winters. <laughs> Um, Natalie, thanks for being here. Not that you have a choice. Uh, 
Now, since we empty chaired you last week, mm -hmm. you're just sitting there for good. You're not moving so that we can't do that again. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I want to talk to you about, I mean, you've had some, some scoops up over the weekend, um, but the one that really, I mean, you could tell that I'm really upset by this, what happened in Denver on Saturday, and not just upset in the sense that, okay, yeah, all right, a guy was murdered, and that happens a lot, you know, it happens less for political reasons, and, and we should be further upset about that, um, but it's the, the lack of regard for this story. That the mainstream media has shown. It's the lack of regard for digging into who actually was this guy, this Matthew Doloff, who was a who actually hired him. Because Pinkerton are now like, oh no, it wasn't us, it was some third party firm. And then K9 News or Nine News or whatever it's called are saying, oh well, you know, we got uh, contractors' details through Pinkerton for this guy. And I understand. There's a murder investigation going on right now. But if this were George Floyd uh, or, or, or Breonna Taylor or anything like that, there would be marches of tens of thousands of people down the street to demand the details of what happened. But instead, what we're getting is that same news agency, Antifa News, is basically what they are, the Antifa News Network, um, hosting a political debate tonight Tell us more about this. In the ongoing saga of biased uh, debate moderators, right, this is coming on the heels of Steve Scully, the former Biden intern and never Trumper, along with Chris Wallace, who loved to interrupt President Trump like no other. We now have Kyle Clark, who, is, who hosts a show entitled Next with Kyle Clark on Nine News. Again, that's the outlet that hired this alleged security guard, which if you actually dig down, it turns out he wasn't registered. He was effectively just some random individual that this company had hired. Uh, but this this talent for the network is now not only moderating the debate, but this network is also hosting the debate. Uh, no real comment has been made, whether coming from the Gardner team, coming from Nine News itself, other than a small statement because one of their investigative reporters was briefly detained right after the shooting, given that the security guard was hired to defend and protect uh, one of their, their talents. But what's also interesting about Kyle Clark, again, dovetailing with the fact that Nine News is definitely sympathetic in some ways towards Antifa. Uh, Kyle Clark followed Antifa on Twitter. He repeatedly tweeted uh, phrases such as, you know, calling Antifa and, and really talking about the threat that they pose to individuals, especially those who support Trump, uh, calling it fear-mongering and that fears over Antifa were turning the group into a boogeyman. Also insisting that the far left, that is the American far left, didn't constitute Antifa, which is a bizarre and absurd and, and farcical accusation on also even comparing in some ways the far left to constitutional conservatives on the right. The takeaway from all these tweets being this guy is no friend to Republicans, in fact maybe even a friend to Antifa, yet he's being billed as an uh, independent, neutral moderator for a, a very critical and crucial Senate debate coming up tonight, I believe. How does it keep happening that Republicans accept these debate moderators? They don't, do they not look into their Twitter feeds? I mean, the first thing I do when a new hire is made, whether it's here at Real America's Voice or whether it's at the National Pulse or whether it's in the War Room or this is the American Principles Project, any of these groups that I work with, when a new hire comes on board, the first thing I do is I go on Twitter Advanced Search and I cross-reference a bunch of different keywords under their username, under their handle. And yet Republicans, and I don't know what these like rapid response teams are doing all day, every day, but Republicans just accept, oh yeah, you got this guy from this local news agency, he'll be fine as an anchor, I'm sure. Read us some of the things he said about Antifa. Sure, he said, uh, Antifa has been turned into one of the biggest boogeymen in politics these days. That comes as Antifa is literally killing supporters of President Trump explicitly but hold because on, they are. where was that from? That was all the way back in 2018. Right, so think about this. 
he was complaining in 2018 that Antifa was being, you know, made a boogeyman. But think about what Antifa did in 2020. So surely he should go back, correct the record, go, oh my goodness, I'm a bad reporter. Instead of listening to the people who are portraying Antifa as a boogeyman and are trying to understand what they were telling us about this entity, this organization, this idea, he should, he, he's not correcting himself. Instead of that, he dismissed all of it. He tweeted what can be seen as a, a public relations attempt for Antifa, right? Mm -hmm. And is he saying anything different now? No, and even if you take Antifa out of it, he has a host of tweets, like in the tens and tens and tens of anti-Trump content, anti-Republican content. So he's definitely not the independent neutral moderator that he's being billed he to be. compare the far left with constitutional conservatives? And then went on to insist that the far left has no relation to Antifa, which that's not much journalistic integrity coming from Nine News. It's extraordinary. Well, I got some uh, some news for you that will break on this show. At the beginning, if you're watching, you'll have heard me talking about MidnightGrim.com and Kate Kenobi, aka Kate McNally. Well, we put in a comment request to Kate McNally, and Kate has responded. So stick around after the break. We'll bring you the defence from Kate McNally, Kate Kenobi, and MidnightGrim.com of their Biden or Die yard signs from Denver. We are back. Well, there's an Elton John song that I'm sure some of you will know. It's called The B Word Is Back. I suppose I can't use that word on air, but we'll be talking about Hillary Clinton and her 5,000-word op-ed for Foreign Affairs magazine in just a moment. It was interesting, that song was uh, written about a woman called Maxine, one of the songwriter's wives, I believe. We've got some Maxine later on in the show as well, don't we, Natalie? Yes. In the meantime, I want to get your thoughts on this. So, Kate, from... Uh, I just want to explain to the audience very quickly, in fact. So, before the show, I'm writing the monologue for the show, the opening, right? It sets the scene, and I really want to talk about what happened in Denver. Nobody else is talking about it. It's, it's incredibly important that we take stock of what's going on in this country right now and represent the life of somebody who was wrongly murdered, executed in the street by an Antifa sympathizer, working for an Antifa network, news network, by the way, which is moderating a debate tonight by a guy who makes excuses for Antifa. And as I'm writing this monologue, a friend of mine reaches out to me from Colorado and says, oh, this sign is up in my neighborhood. I wonder if we can get the sign back up, by the way, on the screens. The sign is in my neighborhood. It says, Biden or die. Biden or die. So I, fi I figured, if you zoom really close into that picture, by the way, in the bottom right of it, you can see the uh, Instagram handle. It says at Midnight Grim. So I look, what's at Midnight Grim? Found this website, Midnight Grim. Went to the website, Midnight Grim, and it's this whole litany of just clearly satanic inspired stuff. So I reached out to this woman. I did my research, figured out who she was. I mean, this is all within the space of about 40, 45 minutes before the show. Figured out who this was. And uh, reached out, and I said, I said to uh, Kate, I said, we're running a story um, about your Biden or Die poster, and we'd like to offer you comment on the matter, because I do real reporting. We allow people to have their say. I said, following the shooting of a Trump supporter in Denver, do you think it's appropriate to be selling signs that could be interpreted as incitement to murder? So she writes back, and fair play to her, because a lot of people don't. She writes back, quote, Raheem, Thanks for reaching out. I'm saddened to hear the about the no wait. I'm saddened to hear the violence against any human, whatever political party they choose to support. This sign is meant to call attention to the gross mishandling of our country by Mr. Trump. That's President Trump to you, Kate. Goes on. 
who has used fear-mongering, lies, gaslighting, science denial and other misleading tactics to create a chaotic and polarized environment. Without acknowledging systemic racism, climate change and publicly supporting groups like the Proud Boys to name a few, Trump's America is becoming a wasteland of misinformation and violence. If we don't vote him out, it is likely an unfathomable amount of people will die. And that is the message of this sign. Let me know if you need anything else. Kate, I do need something else, Kate. I really do. I need you to come on this show. I need you to come on this show whenever you want and explain that garbled, word salad, gibberish, clap trap that just found its way into my email inbox. Kate, 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 okay, Kate. Okay. You put up a sign that says you're selling, you're selling, you're profiteering. You're an anti-capitalist, but you're profiteering off a sign that says Biden or die, okay? And now you're hiding behind a, a, a pandemic that came from the Communist Party of China to cover up what you've been doing here, which is incitement to violence, incitement to murder. But let's be clear about something here. You say Mr. Trump has used fear-mongering lies, gaslighting. Your side perpetrated the Russia hoax. Your side used the resources of media, government, and corporate enterprise to persecute an individual who didn't fit your world view, whose politics were different from yours. And now that they keep beating you at the ballot box democratically, you want them to die. You're the fascists. Do you not understand fascism? Do you not understand where that word comes from? Do you understand what fascism is? The use of the state and the corporate environment and the media together to persecute political enemies. You're murdering people in the street. Your side is killing people. Your side is executing people. And what can you talk about? The Proud Boys. The Proud Boys. A drinking club that wear the same polo shirts and go to pubs in New York together. I've been to one with them. Guess what? The Proud Boys have a Hispanic leader. The Proud Boys invite Raheem Kassam to their events. When are you going to invite me to your events, Kate? I want to see. I want to come. I want to talk to you guys. And I want you to talk to us. So an open invitation to our newly famous friend, Kate McNally, Kate Kenobi, whatever pseudonym you're going by today, to come on the show. You can have your say. Nobody's going to shout over you. I'll give you your time. You can even have Chris Wallace here if you need him. And let's have it. Let's hear it out. Because all I'm hearing here is somebody who's been brainwashed. You've been fed this science denial, you say, science denial. Last time I checked, Dr. Anthony Fauci is still in charge of this thing. Science denial? You say, without acknowledging systemic racism. You're all platitudes. You're all pathos. You've got, no, you, you got no leg to stand on. This president, whether you, whether you agree with it or not, frankly, has done more for ethnic minority communities in this country than since Abraham Lincoln. Kate wouldn't know anything about it. Kate's a privileged lefty who studied probably photography, liberal arts, I don't know, at a liberal university and then lives in, a liberal, in the liberal state of Oregon didn't know anything about racial struggle, class struggle. You're a poser. Become pose on this show. We'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to the National Pulse. I went off on a bit of a, a rant on the uh, on the last segment, impromptu. Uh, what did you think? Very good. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I thought you were going to say exactly. All right, we've got to get back on track here. Lots of news to cover. Um, but I did want to, you pointed something out to me that I didn't appropriately spend time on in, in, in the last segment. And it was from this email from Kate that just said, if we don't vote him out, it is likely an unfathomable amount of people will die. This is what they think. I mean, Steve Bannon says that they've been traumatized, right? People like Kate, maybe we shouldn't be mean to her. She's traumatized. Her side has traumatized her. Remember at the beginning of this pandemic, the, the uppermost number was 2.5 million if it went badly. People would die in the United States. And at 220,000 or thereabouts closing in on at the moment, the media is kind of like celebrating, oh, didn't Trump do such a terrible job? She's traumatized. And I, I genuinely feel bad for these people. I mean, did they think, did they genuinely believe that, the, the, you know, a nation with so many people with so many underlying health conditions would come out of the pandemic, a global pandemic, with under 100,000 people dead? If they thought that, then you know what are these people going to university for? They're morons. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. All right, talk to us about the debate commission because you did some sleuthing, some super sleuthing on the debate commission, something that nobody else has managed to pull out yet. Which again just drives me nuts that it comes down to us who are having to do this stuff. I mean, why aren't the why isn't the Republican? How much money is there in Republican politics? Billions upon billions of dollars flow from these mega donors who I don't take a penny from. These mega donors and they fund all this stuff, all these war rooms and these research teams and the rapid reaction and all this stuff. But again, it comes down to you. So tell us, Natalie, before I burst a blood vessel here, <laughs> tell us what you found. Sure. So the uh, Commission on Presidential Debates, which has been around for, for decades, they're responsible for mod set, uh, selecting moderators, overseeing and organizing the debates that Americans love to watch every four years. Well, one of the individuals who is affiliated with the Board of Directors has ties to two very malign influences that are operating on the shores of the United States, that being the Chinese Communist Party and the Transition Integrity Project. And this connection comes through an organization known as the Bergruen Institute. So we've heard of them before. Yes, we've highlighted this institute uh, for, for months now, not only because they're tied to the Chinese Communist Party. If you go to their homepage, you see pictures of Xi Jinping prominently displayed. They host conferences with him on their board, which Antonia sits on. Uh, there's high level members of the Chinese Communist Party. I counted at least five individuals who are fellows at Chinese Communist Party funded and controlled institutions. You see top, top. Uh, leadership from effectively China lobbying groups like the Asia Society, which orchestrate networks uh, known as the Confucius Institute, which, which pump propaganda into American schools. So they are thoroughly, thoroughly embedded with the Chinese Communist Party. And this also dovetails again with the attempt to steal the election from President Trump and secure a Joe Biden victory, that coming in the form of the Transition Integrity Project, specifically Nils Gilman. You may remember him as he called a Effectively for the execution of Michael and No, not effectively. He outright called for it. Yeah, he called for it on Twitter brazenly in the open. Uh, Maybe he has a Biden or die yard sign. <laughs> he does, uh, more or less. But he is a vice president or vice director of programs. He also helps uh, run one of the, the institution's magazines. But I think that what you see going on with the presidential uh, commission on debates right now, it's a similar effect with to the like of Steve Scully, right? He was exposed as a former Joe Biden intern and never Trumper, and even Chris Wallace, who interrupted Trump several times more than he did Joe Biden, because Joe Biden didn't really say much. But this, I think, is when you get into the legacy of the Trump administration, and it's really just bulldozing the, the facade of neutrality, whether it's in this uh, form of the mainstream media, right? Think about how many Americans now understand, you know, we've always kind of been attuned to the fact that CNN is their running dogs for the establishment, but now your average American voter understands CNN is not independent, is not bipartisan. The the Commission on Presidential Debates is not independent, is not bipartisan. Those bureaucrats that stood up there during impeachment and told President Trump that we don't agree how you're doing foreign policy, they're not nonpartisan. They're partisan hacks. They're, even, frankly, the Republican establishment in the form of RNC throughout the
the 2016 election, people now know that there is a stark difference between what Republican voters and, and the working class ones and that of the kind of Republican apparatus. And I think what you're seeing going on with this presidential debate is kind of more of the same. And that's a lasting effect of the Trump presidency, because even come 2024, people are going to be, as you say, going through the Twitters of these moderators, looking at old tweets, looking who they interned for. It's usually right in public and when you go to their bios on C-SPAN. But right. now I think people finally, finally care and understand how this is part and of the broader... And this is how you know that yeah. President Trump is disrupting a broader consensus, right? The Uniparty, um, which is because the, the, they always turn around and go, oh, well, find us a moderator who hasn't interned for Biden. You know, well, yeah, I mean, everyone's basically interned for Biden in D.C. He's been around 50 years and they all go through the same thing, right? Find me a lobbyist for the Chinese Communist Party who hasn't worked for Maxine Waters. Dana Thompson, uh, former, former, I believe it's chief, actually served as chief of staff for another Democratic representative, Sheila Jackson Lee of impeachment fame, but he also served as legislative director and chief counsel to Representative Maxine Waters, and he lobbied not just for one, but three very distinct and equally nefarious Chinese Communist Party effectively owned uh, institutions, one of them being ZTE, which is a telecommunications company akin to Huawei in the sense that it's effectively a backdoor for the Chinese Communist Party. To, to gain access into America's technological infrastructure. The second company being Vertex Railcar Corps, which is operating in and around Chicago. Uh, with It was a joint partnership between an American company and a company known as China Railway Construction Corps, uh, which was later identified by the Department of Defense in documents unsealed by the Trump administration as a proxy of the People's Liberation Army. Again, always a threat of stealing intellectual property. And lastly, a organization that is comparable to Confucius institutes in which many colleges have actually turned down accepting money from them given their ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to follow more of those stories and get them out to your friends and family members and colleagues, etc., etc., the website is thenationalpulse.com. Those scoops are there on the home page. You can also go to our Twitter feed, at the Nat Pulse. Find us on Facebook, on Parler. You can find Natalie Winters, at Natalie G. Winters, and yours truly, at Raheem Kassam. Just before I let you go, for the rest of the day, I want to say thank you. You can go to thenationalpulse.com forward slash donate is a new link we have up for people who don't want to join a monthly membership thing you can just give off one-off donations the nationalpulse.com forward slash donate and i'm out of time so i'm gonna to have to save hillary clinton for you for tomorrow but find her 5,000 word op-ed in foreign affairs have a read over it tonight and we'll talk about it tomorrow we'll see you then